Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. Well, the second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. say you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some psyops going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema psyops. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. Cinema psyops. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. the 286th consecutive week and counting of mediocrity, stupidity, immaturity, and still not understanding exactly how the fuck a bunch of assholes on Reddit were able to take down a single hedge fund. I'm your host, Court. This show is Cinema PsyOps and pissed off and really upset with himself on his monumental fuck up is my co-host, Matt. I mean, that shit hurt. Like, I mean, like a motherfucker. That shit almost hurt as bad as if I would have shorted a metric fuck ton of GameStop stock. You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) Just tell me what stocks to buy to hurt rich people. That's all I need to hear. You had had me at hurt rich people. Just tell me what to do. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. I I got some money I could throw that and and I could just throw away just to know that rich people got hurt. Sure, I could do that. I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't. It's it's the only thing that matters in the world is to hurt rich people. <laughs> yeah, because when rich people feel like something's coming for them, you know, it's the end of the world because they've literally never been persecuted in their entirety of their life. Yeah, oh, my God. The slightest little slight against them makes them feel like they have been persecuted. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're going to be like, oh, this is bigotry against us. And it's like, no, it's not. It's it's just now you got to play fair. And fairness to them is is being them being cheated. <laughs> and if you think about it, yeah, there's a whole bunch of problems. I don't want to make it sound like these Wall Street bets folks that are doing this are actually good people because there's a lot of hard R's in that fucking chat room. Oh, my God. Uh, it, me and a, a, a friend of mine who I work with, when this all first kind of started, um, and, and I got introduced that I'd never seen that subreddit before. Uh, and so I was like, well, let's let me check it out because I started hearing about this and I'm like wow that word is even more harsh just typed out i mean and it is all over the place they uh they 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 really got their own way of doing things i guess i don't know it is essentially a gathering of internet trolls that took on wall street and yeah really made them terrified it's it's your classic gamer chat room or or even just that's just a gamer chat room your your classic 
gamer fucking G- gambler gambler chat room <laughs> gambler chat or but like uh, not even just a gamer chat room but like uh, in game chat you know uh, fuck uh, the old days of PUBG and their live game chat on PC was fucking horrific it's one of the reasons why Microsoft very rarely allows games to have open chat is because they're like Jesus we see what the people do on PC and it's fucking gross <laughs> Right. So th- those are the folks that are doing what it is that they're doing. So there's still no heroes in this. But no. in in the effort of class solidarity, I'm all for hurting rich people. Just tell me what stocks to hurt rich people. Yeah, I mean, hurting rich people should be the goal number one of this whole fucking thing. <laughs> right. Where it hurts them the most, the pocketbook. We're not even talking physical. It's the anything. only thing they care about is money. So yeah. yeah. And, and get them where it hurts and get them by the rules of their own game and make them play by the rules. And yeah, that, that's great. Otherwise, yep. fuck that subreddit because it's all yeah. sorts of fucked up. I mean, yeah, stop, stop. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> what the fuck are you people doing? Right, over there? it's it's okay to have anti heroes. I mean, after all, I am a huge fan of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. It's okay to have anti heroes, but you need to acknowledge that Walt was a fucking psychopath and a greedy bastard, and all the bad things that happened to him, he earned and he deserved, and he destroyed lives. Yeah, you have oh, to yeah. accept that. And the same goes for Saul Goodman. You may love Saul Goodman, and you may love a lot of the stuff that he's done and all the scams that he's done, but he has also wrecked lives and ruined reputations and destroyed people's lives to get oh, where yeah. he is. You well, know? I mean, the whole thing of Breaking Bad is he's making fucking meth, so yeah, he's destroying lives you don't even get to see on camera. Well, that I'm not, that I'm not concerned about. Selling. I'm concerned about the people that are directly in his circle, that things that he chose to do, the people that loved and trusted oh. him and okay. his own family. I mean, that, but I'm just saying, there are no heroes in Breaking Bad. <laughs> I know, but like what I'm saying is the meth thing is a different level of what he did that's horrible. Yeah. I'm saying what he did with what he could have done with the people that are in his life directly and how he treated them. Oh, that, okay. That's that's the worst part of it <laughs> beyond just making meth. <laughs> beyond just, you know, making a drug that is one of the biggest killers in this country. <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is I don't have a problem with people cooking meth to make money. <laughs> <laughs> and stop That's judging. That's gotta some, be a clip somehow. Just stop judging lifestyle choices when it comes to cooking meth to make money. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other things that he did, like how he treated his wife that make him a bad person. Oh, I mean, yeah, he treated his wife like shit. So, I mean, I get that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, seriously, man, um, I did not have what this week, on my... I mean, what a week it's been. Every yeah. time, man, we, we, we're a once a week show. And lately in the last few years, man, uh, not just few, well, in the last year, something major happens in the week. In between shows. Yeah, it's I'm getting really, really beyond the part where I'm even shocked and fatigued anymore. I'm, yeah. I'm like a fucking comic book character that's just sitting there, like, thinking maybe this is the wrong week I picked to quit drinking. Yeah, yeah, this is <laughs> no, you know the I mean? wrong week to quit sniffing yeah, glue. Yeah, I'm that guy from Airplane. That's exactly yeah. who I am. I am Lloyd Bridges' fucking controller guy yeah. from Airplane. I'm And every week is the wrong week that I pick to try to quit doing this or that or, or whatever it is. Although I'm yeah. pretty vanilla these days so it's like, oh man, I picked the wrong week to get back off of carbs. Oh man, I picked the wrong week to stop doing Ben Gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I picked the wrong week to cut my caffeine intake. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, we're, we're all getting pretty old here, so... <laughs> Yeah, the, the is, harshness of things are dropping as well. Yeah, I mean, this is probably the craziest fucking year of my entire life, and I'm counting 2020. But like, the, yeah. the fiscal year of cinema psyops that has still not stopped. This is the craziest fiscal year of cinema psyops of my life. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> this Oof. time frame, yeah. But you know what's about to make it better, Matt? What's that? We're in the middle of February now. This is the start of February, and we're going to be trucking right through. This release is like you know the first Sunday of February, I, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, March is coming up. Do you remember what March is, Matt? So isn't that going to be March Mate? March Mate is coming up. And why are we having March Mate instead of May Mate, Matt? Because in May we're going to do a full franchise fest. Yes, but also because that makes it sooner and that brings the yeah. pain uh, for you more. Yeah. No, that, I mean, it's great that you're bringing that up the night I deleted 10 fucking clips and had to redo <laughs> them all. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm I'm just piling on. So March yeah, Mate, I know. March Mate is less than three weeks away from tonight Ugh, for you. It's fucking And three weeks, are, like three weeks away for this is this is the first of four episodes before March Matei, I believe. Maybe less. Well, I don't like anything. 
<laughs> I don't like anyone. I, I'm having a good time torturing you. Because you made me wait so long, I'm just going to sit here and just fucking rip into you for a little while because I'm a catty little fucking bitch tonight, apparently. Yeah, you are, man. You're worse than like a sorority girl who just got like fucking dumped right before homecoming. Okay, if I were that bad, I would be at your house right now with a black magic marker circling your arms and various areas where you need to lose weight and tone up. Yeah. Oh, well, fuck, you don't have enough ink or marker for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, it would just basically be, I'd be tagging you like a uh, like somebody that's going to be digging and they want to make sure the lines are okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> On the ground when they're spray painting the ground, like marking the, the underground conduits. <laughs> Pretty much, that's exactly what you'd be doing, yeah. <laughs> and by the time I was done, you would look like Goldfinger only in black spray paint. <laughs> and that's a very, very bad look for a white dude to be walking around like that. Yeah, pretty bad. I'm pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, we've we've done enough patter. We've had enough pablum for everybody. Let's uh, let's get pablum. Into it. Yeah. All right. So, fucking a, enough enough about my failures. Well, no, there's never enough about your failures. We're just moving on for now. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> so the tales that have been told for tonight's movie are twice thusly. Yes. <laughs> uh, if, if you want to say it in such a fancy sense. <laughs> I don't know Jesus. if that's fancy, more like I might have been having a stroke for a second. Yeah, did you just like, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can taste the air. It's weird. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> No, so Twice Told Tales is a collection in its original form, is a book, which is a collection of Nathaniel Hawthorne's short stories. Huh? And they're twice told because they were previously published in magazines and newspapers and things like that when they used to buy short stories to help fill up the paper for people for entertainment sections stuff. Uh. Now, these are all collected into a book, hence why they are twice told, because now they're in a book form collected together, and they were already told in magazines. That's where the name of the book, Twice Told Tales, come from. Now, this collection of short stories is what became our film, Twice Told Tales, which makes no sense as a film title. I feel it should have been changed, but I get it. They're trying to tie it in with Nathaniel Hawthorne and in title that you know. Yeah. Now, here's the really weird thing. Only one of the stories is in the original collection of Twice Told Tales. It's in this movie. The weird. third story, House of the Seven Gables, was an actual full-fledged novel beforehand. So huh. <laughs> there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, well, are we going to say which one's our favorite story after uh, this whole thing is done or before? Uh, let's save it till the very end. Although I think it would be extremely clear which ones I'm going to dislike more. Because there's one that I really liked and then there's others that I'm kind of mediocre is, is how I'm kind of feeling about it. Where I'm kind of like, man, whatever, you know. Uh, yeah, there's one I really liked. One who's my clear cut favorite. One that I thought was okay. And then one where I was like, that's just the There's only three of them. <laughs> yeah. So one I really liked. Uh -huh. One I thought thought that was okay. okay and then there's another one that i just didn't care for at all oh okay i thought you were saying like the line that jackie mason says about his mom being half jewish half english half spanish oh <laughs> and robert no. stack replies that's three halves and he's always oh, she was a big woman she's a big <laughs> i love that <laughs> Oh, Caddyshack 2 had its moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll simp for Caddyshack 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it had its moments. Is that the correct usage of that? That's what these kids are saying these days, and I just want to make sure they're getting it right. Yeah, is that, yeah, I, is that a I, thing I, that I should be saying? I or? think so. Yeah, you're simping for it. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Fuck it, I don't care. If it's if it's horrible and it doesn't make any sense, who gives a shit? Nobody, nobody fucking cares about what I have to say. No, they really don't. I'm I mean, just... no, one, no one should care about what any of us have to say. So let's all get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not even going to try and come back from that. I got music that fits in with the theme and spooky, old-timey feeling of the film. But first, we're going to have our regular Legion Patreon ad. Oh, all right. This will keep it quiet. <laughs> oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me Cutting a New Show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. <laughs> I said quiet. <laughs> My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com, or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. 
For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. We're back to the regular Legion Patreon ad because uh, coronavirus is no longer something we need to worry about anymore, apparently, and uh, well, the, the world has moved on, so we're going to stop playing the GoFundMe ad. Oh, there you go. All right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, according to our government here in the state of Nebraska, we don't even need a fucking station for the vaccine. Fuck them. Uh, like, legit, that was offered to us, and we didn't take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we've done enough political and world event stuff. Here's the fucking trailer instead. From the vivid imagination of that master storyteller of the macabre, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Alice! Comes Twice Told Tales, a trio of terrifying experiences, brilliantly portrayed by that personification of all evil on the screen, Vincent Price. In this tomb, you will live a pulse-quickening adventure as two friends dabble in the black arts, and a secret buried in the grave returns to haunt two unfaithful lovers. You died, Sylvia. You've been dead for 38 years. In this garden of evil unfolds the diabolic delineation of the most fantastic horror conceived by a distorted mind. Since my father made me what I am, he used its poisons to change the chemistry of my blood. Watch that poor creature die. You would die if you touched me. In this house of seven gables, filled with the brooding mystery of an ancient curse, its very walls creaking with evil, a chilling tale of vengeance casts a spell of horror beyond belief. That was his blood. The pensions are cursed. Every male member of the family has died the same way. Did you recognize the voice of the trailer guy there? No. Okay. Do you ever watch uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle when you were a kid? Yes. All right. The announcer for Rocky and Bullwinkle, that was the same guy. His name is Paul Freese. Well, how about that? Paul Freese has done a shit ton of voiceovers, and he is an unbelievable voice artist, and he's got a very, very cool voice and does a lot of shit with it. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we had Paul Freese show up as our trailer guy voice in this show. I, I, I would say so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that guy's had a pretty distinguished career there. <laughs> All right, enough pussyfooting around. Let's, uh, let's get to the only story which was actually featured in the original House of Seven Gables that was the adaptation. That's this story that we're talking about right now. It's the only one of the three that actually showed up in that collection. All right. Dr. Hedger's experiment. Uh, well, because it's Vincent Price and he's monologuing, it's going to be our first clip. Throughout the ages, the heavens have unleashed their fury to make man tremble in the presence of the unknown. And as man has witnessed the power of nature's elements, so have some men sought desperately in this infinite power the secret of why they are born and why they will die. While the very ground on which they walk, the earth that will bury them, remains to mock their existence. Scary shit. Yeah, well, I mean, Vincent Price could basically read me the ingredients off of a fucking back of a 
Betty Crocker easy yeah. bake cake or what the fuck ever, and I would be creeped out. And I'd guarantee you that the way he reads it would be better than you would ever hear anyone ever in the history of the world do it again. Oh yeah, every monologue that begins and ends the story, it's a it's a clip because it's Vincent fucking Price. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you would be remiss if you didn't. When I saw that you gave me twelve clips to yeah. load up, I'm like, oh yeah, of course. I was well, like, six of the you, you know six, six of those of are monologue. Yeah, and six of them <laughs> very rightly should be because it will enhance the show to have Vincent Price's beautiful fucking voice on it. Exactly. Uh, we start with two old friends, Alex and Carl. They're getting together for Carl's 80th birthday. Carl laments on their friendship, how long they've been friends, and now his long since dead fiance Sylvia. He takes out a withered rose from a book. It's something that used to be on his wedding band. And he asks Alex that when he dies to make sure that he is buried with this withered rose. Carl then goes and toasts Sylvia's tomb. Alex states that Carl should have actually moved on and married, uh, uh, someone different and this by this point he would have grandchildren taking care of him um again they're in the middle of this very terrible storm and when it is done they both see that the crypt door has been blown open carl stating that door has not been opened for 30 plus years they check on the crypt and they find a uh, sylvia's coffin and when they open it they find her perfectly preserved for 30 s- years carl checks and he believes the water that's been dripping on the coffin uh, for the last 30 years constantly is the reason for this. And so he takes some of the water to study. The whole time, Alex is a little a little afraid. Alex being Vincent Price, who's in every one of these stories. Yeah, it's rare to have Vincent Price play such a timid, afraid of such goings on type character, but does it quite well. He plays the fear up really, really well. And we need to talk about the old age makeup and the aging that was done to these guys, yes. how they grade their hair and everything. The attention to detail on this uh, in like a 4K upscale from this just standard Blu-ray was incredible. It still looked great. And and they actually caked on enough layers of the makeup to make their skin even more wrinkly. And it was somewhat translucent and still kind of like an opaque <laughs> yeah, look at the I same mean, time in spots. And it was really grisly and it looked like they had been used hard and put away very mistreated. Well, yeah, I mean, they you can tell these are men who are aged and they are they've lived long lives. And so, uh, yeah, I thought the makeup they did was really really good so i thought the effects in this story were really good yeah that's one of the highlights of this film or this portion of the film um are the effects and right off the bat they they definitely throw them right in your face with the way that these guys are aged and yeah we'll kind of see more as we go of the classic uh you know i for lack of a better term practical effects mixed with in camera or simple film dissolved techniques that have you know been almost ageless they've been used since the dawn of film Um, uh, yeah. And I would say probably used to the best of their ability for the equipment that was available at the time as well when we get there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I agree, actually. Uh, so uh, they uh, bring the water in and Carl studies it and he thinks it came from a virgin spring, an untouched spring. And that's maybe why it has these healing properties. Uh, they test it on that withered rose and the rose comes right back to life. I thought that was a pretty cool effect. The way that they did the rose effect, there are cross dissolves and then they also use like a time lapse where they are reversing a rose basically being slowly pressed and dried. Okay. I think they did it between two pieces of glass over time and pressed the flower and filmed it and did, you know, stop piece by piece as they were doing it. And then they just let it go in reverse after it flattened and that's how they got it to look like it did. And then they just kind of cross dissolved between the actual flat rose and that rose over time to really give it that that life. And it's really well done. There's a lot of great mat work with that and somebody had to do that practically by hand <laughs> nice. to, to transition it. So yeah, it's, it's gorgeous and it is the probably some of the best of that type of work that you're going to get for the time honestly yeah i mean i thought it looked pretty fucking awesome for the time yeah this story uh, is definitely a showpiece whether or not you like the actual tale behind it that's to be debated but i cannot argue with the effects the acting or the way that the story is presented in any way shape or form and i do like the story so uh and everything else you just said So, uh, Carl decides to drink it, and all of a sudden, while he feels a fever and not so well, he actually starts getting very much, he gets younger. Um, 
So then Alex tries it as well, who is pretty afraid. He doesn't know if they should be messing with this kind of power. But, uh, you know, uh, he is convinced to try it, and he does, and he gets younger with very cool effects And when they look at themselves in the mirror. Similar to how they did it for the rose, but instead of letting it kind of dry out over time on its own to give it that uh, that look of it wilting, they basically did like a Wolfman transition where they probably did the makeup in stages, but they reversed that to make them look like they were getting younger. You know, like, oh, I gotcha. You know how like they would put the Wolfman, they'd have him lay down, he'd have his head on a pillow, and then slowly over time you would see the hair start to just form on his face with crossed his yeah. eyes. I think they did mm-hmm. the same thing only with adding the old age makeup in stages or age them in stages, which would probably take even longer. Both these gentlemen were probably extremely patient, but I love the way the gray hair looked, and then when they get to the black hair, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but uh, Heidegger, the homeboy there with the big bushy beard, had a yeah. really nice sheen to his beard. He was clearly using a very high grade beard oil. Probably, yeah. yeah. It was really well groomed, and and like I caught a couple of glimpses of like how well it sh- had a sheen for the oil, <laughs> for the beard oil on it. I'm like, damn, that is one sweet beard that dude has going. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did. It was a nice beard. Carl, he says he wants to try it on Sylvia, but Alex says it can't. It, it, there's no way she can drink it. Well, then Carl brings out a new found technology that's new to the medical per, you know, community, uh, a syringe. Uh, so he uses it and he injects her with the water. I love um, Vincent Price's terror at this and how he's like, yes. this is dreadful. How could you? You cannot and, do this. This is yeah, wrong. He, well, he keeps trying to get it away from Sylvia. And in fact, if you really pay attention to this whole entire movie, every time she's brought up, he tries to change the subject to something else. Yes, they um, set that up well in the yeah. story. Yeah. Uh, well, she wakes up and they tell her everything because to her, she's like, hey, we're getting married tomorrow. She thinks that the next day is her wedding. They tell her everything and she kind of freaks out a little bit, but then comes to grips because they both look the same, of course. And uh, he says, uh, she's like, well, then we can still get married. Carl agrees and he goes to grab her wedding dress that he has kept. Uh, after he leaves, Sylvia and Alex have her own conversation. And that's our next clip. Care for some wine? Is it good wine, Alex? Such as we had yesterday. That yesterday is 38 years ago, of course. Please, Sylvia. When we had our final argument. Sylvia, please. He'll hear you. Don't let him know. It would break his heart. And what of my heart, Alex? You had no conscience about that, did you? I loved you. You know that. Love? Take all a woman has to offer, and then refuse to marry her. Is that your idea of love? You know how I felt about marriage from the beginning. I loved you, but I wanted to be free. You gave yourself to me. Are you trying to say that, that I seduced you? you? think you would have been happy marrying him despite me? I wanted to be your wife, not just another woman. If only you had loved me enough. Isn't it love enough that a man would murder for you? Murder? Do you know why you became ill so suddenly the night before your wedding? I poisoned you. Do you think I wanted to see you in the arms of another man? But you insisted on mocking me by going ahead with your spite marriage to Carl. You forced me to do what I had to do. All right, Alex. Maybe I was wrong to have that much pride, but we can be married now. We've been given another chance. We can't make the same mistake again. How can I tell Carl? He's lived like a monk all these years, holding on to your memory as as if it were something sacred. I've never destroyed the illusion for you. I don't know as I could do it now. All I know is, I don't want to live again if I can't have you. Tell him the truth. You must, Alex. Please. I'll try. 
And this is where we get the Vincent Price villain that we've come to know and love. Yes, here's the here's the man who's not so cool. <laughs> yeah, this is the villainous, fucking vile <laughs> human being. Trash. Yeah. Of oh, my best friend, and now, <laughs> yeah, you're an asshole. <laughs> Dude is banging. Well, he was banging her, and then when she wanted to get married, he dropped her like a fucking and- hot plate, like a piece of shit, and then and- murdered her when she married somebody else because he couldn't deal with it yeah wow i mean that is just some hardcore shit and she still loves him yeah he confesses that to her and she's like oh that's okay we'll just give it another go we've gotten another chance that is so romantic in her eyes yeah that is wow fucked dude that's like uh-huh. seven levels of fuck this is the point where the whole betrayal thing and the murder and all of that like that stuff was all cool to me but the fact that she was like oh i forgive you and i'll always love you i'm like no yeah that's yeah that's a bit fucked up right <laughs> yeah that that level of subservient obsession is you know just i guess they were better times for a guy back then matt yeah i guess yeah every, everyone was having a good time man <laughs> <laughs> every male if was you're having, a man yeah if you were a <laughs> <laughs> cis white male you were having a great time back then yeah yeah back then man everything was going good for you if you're a cis white male <laughs> <laughs> right but i do like uh during the clip we need to also discuss there's a sequence where um carl comes down the stairs very quietly sneaking with the wedding dress he wants to surprise her oh and, I, yes i need to say he he does hear them talking so yeah yeah, yeah. And, and he overhears them for a good portion of this and then he goes upstairs just just quietly enough to slam the door of where he was at so that he warns them that they're coming and then he sneaks down with the wedding dress and yes. that's where we're at now. Yes. He uh, comes down, like, I said, pre- like we said, he pretends nothing has happened. Carl then sends Sylvie off to go try on the dress. At this point, Alex is fumbling, trying to figure out a way to, to tell Carl what happened while Carl's peeling an apple with a knife. Then, uh, uh, when he's getting ready to say, Carl pretty much lets him know he heard everything and he attacks him with the knife well during the struggle alex actually does i don't he he doesn't really take the knife but he kind of causes carl to stab himself in the stomach it seems killing him so uh as it comes down carl ages again back to his original age while he's sitting there dead at that point uh we see uh sylvia comes down she starts screaming alex then looks up and he is also re-aged and then he looks and sylvia is nothing but skull and dust in her wedding dress and falls. No, she Al- has never looked fucking better than that moment right there. <laughs> Well, Alex didn't think so, so he goes for the water in the crypt, but finds that it is run dry and states that it's taken everything from him. Carl, Sylvia, and left him with nothing. What a hell of a night. Just like all this happened over the course of maybe an hour. Uh, Jesus. That's also, it's Carl's birthday, right? They were celebrating yeah, Carl's, it was Carl's birthday. birthday. So yeah. look what happened on Carl's birthday. His last Carl's birthday, dead. too. Yeah. yeah. He brings his wife back from the dead, or would-be wife back from the dead, to find out that she never loved him and was just using him to get back at Vincent Price's character, who was his best friend and never told him, who also poisoned his would-be bride, who he lived like a monk for afterwards. Jesus fucking Christ. The more you discuss it, the worse it actually gets. Yeah, it's just uh, horrific. And it all ends with a, a Vincent Price narration to close it out in our next clip. Man's dream of eternal youth. An illusion that begins with the first awakening of his mind and lasts until the moment when he goes to his final rest. Only a dream, perhaps. But what would life be without our dream? Okay, we're not discussing whether or not we liked this one or which one is our favorite or whatever. Um, I will say that I enjoyed the story while it's not my absolute favorite. Okay, all right. I will say that. Um, I'm not going to say that anything more than that, but I do want to discuss just a couple of things about the stuff that I like. We kind of dug into it enough. Um, the effects for this throughout the whole way are great. I like this sort of monkey's paw way of discovering the fountain of youth where it turns out it's not permanent. You could have had one night where you could have lived your life again and fixed your choices at least for one night before turning back to who you once were and you muck it up by jealousy and bitterness and infighting and it's just a total accurate account of what humanity really is like i love the nihilism of this part of the story oh it's it's 
horrifically nihilistic. I always think, though, maybe this was better for Carl, because you imagine if Carl was like, all right, let's get married. And then when they were walking down, she turned into dust, walking down the aisle to him. That that probably would have fucked him up pretty bad. (laughs) Yes, but I would argue, Matt, the fact that it wears off and then that's the reveal would be equally, if not more horrific. Like where it's wearing off and they're actually really good friends and they really, really cared and they thought they had a chance at happiness again and it literally crumples to dust in their mouth. Oh, like like as he's kissing her, like you may now kiss yeah. the bride. She crumbles I, into just dust. Saying, all of this could have been a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, that's the problem that I have, Matt. Is I want it more. Like I really wanted to twist the light, the knife more. I like the backstabbing bitchiness and awfulness of Vincent Price's character. I love that man is its the worst monster, you know, and that they yeah. squander this this gift that they have the way that they do. I like those aspects of it. I just I don't know. I something about Nathaniel Hawk. Hawthorne's storytelling that makes me just go, no. (laughs) Like, I just, really, yeah, I just kind of recoil away from it a little bit. Uh, But I, like I said, this one, every, every aspect of it, the way they're delivering it and everything, I think I just need it to be a little more Tales from the Crypt and over the top because they're trying to drive home the love and the romance and they're shortcutting it to the point where the woman doesn't mind that she was literally murdered by the love of her life. I I get that. um, uh, And I find that to be like, oh, that's their sickness. You know, that's, they're all sick and gross and having problems and you know there's nothing um there's nothing carl could have done differently that you know and and vincent price's character is just so self-absorbed and that you know he, he never wants to be married never wants to be locked down but he also doesn't want anyone to quote unquote have his toys so it's like you know it, it's like a kid who's like oh, i'm tired of this toy but i don't want to see anybody else playing with it <laughs> yeah I, and i get where that appealed to you i just i that's it, it just didn't work for, as much for me i guess i don't know yeah. but yeah like i said there's so much about this to fucking like that the quibbles about the love story part of it being kind of hackneyed in there mm-hmm. i mean just to find out about the whole resurrection and like when she finds out that he murdered her like it, that's when shit should have hit ban you know yeah like it should have just gotten crazy and then she turns to dust like when uh you know he's like oh we can finally be together and he goes to kiss her and then that's when i want her i want i want some necrophilia Matt. Yeah, you, okay so you want vincent price to be like now we can be together and then boom she she's re-dead again but he's okay with it yeah and then it gets oh real. he's okay no yeah and then it's bomb chicka bow wow you got a lot of problems <laughs> i absolutely do so let's move on to the next story while i fantasize about that you, you got a lot of emotional problems man all right uh, we move yeah. on to Rapicini's daughter. And that, of course, Vincent Price narrates the opening, so that's our next clip. Among the most beautiful and wonderful of the Lord's creations are the things that grow from the earth. It is strange indeed that the verdant green of grass and leaf, the myriad colors and fragrances of flowers, all meant to be solace to the soul of man and be so distorted that their very essence become evil. Their only use, death. Yeah. God damn. He's just so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is no arguing that at all. Um. So uh, we open up uh, a young man. Uh, I, I don't know how to say his, pronounce his name. Uh, uh, <laughs> Probably should say not it. say. Yeah, I don't know. His name's Paul. Um, Paul, he talks to a young lady named Beatrice. Uh, he wants to visit with her, but she begs him off and says to leave her alone. Um, as she does all this, her, we see her father, who is played by Vincent Price, is listening the whole time. Uh, the boy talks to his landlady and she tells him that no one has been ever visited that house since she's been employed by that family. So then, uh, the next day he's in his university and he talks to his professor and that's our next Next clip. Ah, my young friend Giovanni. You get to look more like your father every day. You have some question about the lesson? Uh, no, sir. It's uh, quite personal. It's, it's about a girl. Oh? One minute I think I'm in love with her, and the next minute I say to myself, well, how can that be, Giovanni? I, I've never even been close enough to hold her hand. And you think this is a problem an old science professor can solve? Well, you've lived in Padua all your life. You might know the family. The name is Rappuccini. This girl is called Beatrice. Then you do know her. I have never seen her. No one has. Except you, apparently. This is crazy. 
Twenty years ago, the girl's father, Giacomo Rappaccini, taught science in this very room. There were many who thought he was destined to be the greatest scientist of our century. Then suddenly he gave up his career. Everything. He locked himself inside his house and no one has seen him since. But what of Beatrice? Surely she... She may have been the cause of it. No one really knows. All that the people of Padua have learned is that after the girl was born, Rappaccini's wife deserted him. Ran away with another man. That was when he left the university and locked his door in the face of the world. Come, come, there are plenty of other girls in Padua. Uh, thank you, Professor. You've been very kind. Wow. Yes. That's a thank whole you. lot of drama and backstory. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne has a real problem with unfaithful women, apparently. Yeah, makes you wonder where uh, all that came from, right? <laughs> yeah, he has some trust issues, apparently. Huh. <laughs> It just makes you wonder what's going on. Now, I don't, I've never read the original story of either of these two. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll get to that whenever we do the final thoughts kind of part of the discussion because I have some pretty interesting story about how I saw this movie for the first time. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I will say this either the screenwriter who adapted all of these really wanted to highlight issues with trust with women or, uh, control over the agency of the body of a woman and what she does with it because that's in oh, this yeah. a lot and it's fucking uncomfortable to watch it in 2021 yeah it really is i mean it does not paint women in a good light well and also it's really horrible the way that they're being treated and how they just accept it in these stories which we're about to really get to and i'll shut up now yes all right so uh so then uh, we see the dad's gardening, and there, see, there's this particular pant that seems to be burning like an acid, and it makes him cough a lot. Uh, we see that only his daughter can come out, and he has to wear these gloves, but only she can come out and touch it with her bare hands. He says they need three blooms and cut from it. She does that, but she is real sassy about it, really talking a lot of shit to her father about you know how everything's kind of uh she's locked away and i mean really just uh, and also like uh the plant you can't even touch it anymore but he's like don't worry i could still destroy it if i want so then uh the dad makes a solution out of it and the daughter apparently needs it to live but she uh but because of all this getting this apparently she can never leave her home and she's not very happy about that stating that it's pretty much his home is like a prison both physically and spiritually this relationship is toxic yeah Ooh, big time big time yeah um they uh then they test it on a guinea pig and it turns the guinea pig purple and it dies uh the next day uh the uh young man he's talking to the daughter again and they flirt a little bit later on the boy grabs some flowers and then takes the house key from the housekeeper uh, which he's trying to go into the property and, and lets himself in so i'm like hey dude that's a little rude you know uh that's also a lot illegal yeah that's you get you can get you you do that in like fucking mississippi you're gonna get yourself shot or any other place that has a king and castle law yeah 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 um i mean let's face it if it were illegal here i would probably do it if this place was if they were in america yeah that could be dead already uh he walks into the garden he sees this butterfly flying and it lands on that evil plant and then the butterfly turns gray and dies he starts coughing a lot and he goes to reach for the insect but beatrice stops him as they talk, she tells him that he has to leave, and he has to leave now. They can never come back. But then the dad shows up. He keeps saying how she, he wants her to go with him to Easter Sunday Mass, and she keeps telling him that she can't go and he needs to leave. But the father says that there's no reason why she shouldn't be able to go, and she should be able to have a good time. And then she runs off very angry and frustrated. The boy leaves, you know, he's like, what was that? And he goes, uh, you know, uh, the dad was like, you know, my uh, young lady's can have some emotional issues is what the father says um and so he the dad brings in the throat of flowers and he throws them to her and when she catches them they burn at the touch of her skin so we see that this is why no one can touch her she's pretty much poisonous yeah that's fucked up yeah way fucked up considering that you have to be under the belief that the father did this to her you are most definitely under that belief because they flat yeah. out say that he did well later on she calls for the boy to come out and she talks to him and that is our next clip Bonnie, I had to talk to you. Then let's talk in town. They'll be celebrating for the holidays. No. No, I can't go. There's no place I can go. 
Don't you realize that by now? Well, this isn't a prison, Beatrice. That gate is open. Oh, Giovanni, if it were only true. That's why I must talk to you. Forget me, Giovanni. Forget you ever saw me. Is that why you called me down here? Tell me to forget you? Oh, why should I? I couldn't forget you if I wanted to. We must both forget Giovanni. Beatrice, I don't... No further! Listen to me. You must listen. You saw the butterfly die when it touched that plant. Yes. You would die if you touched me. What kind of nonsense is that? Why should you and that plant... This is what you must understand. Do you expect me to believe such ridiculous... It's the truth. Let my hand touch yours. Will I die? Are you telling me that if I... if I should kiss you, I'd fall dead as that butterfly did? Yes. As air is your life, so is poison mine. This is the way I've been ever since I was born. Since my father made me what I am. Your father? We're both his creations. Plant and I. He used its poisons to change the chemistry of my blood. I refuse to accept this. Oh, how can I make you understand? Yeah, I took that as her father did that on purpose to her to make her a prisoner and make her have to stay there. Oh, he definitely did. Yeah. I mean, that's that's fact. Yeah. And you find out later why. Um, but anyway, to prove a point to him, she finds a small lizard, touches it, and it burns and dies. She says the dad did it so she couldn't sin like her mother did. And so men couldn't touch her, endangering her soul. So that's why he did it. Which because is the mother fucked. He's trying to control up. her body. Yeah, yeah, because the mom cheated on him, he blamed the daughter. Yeah, which is all sorts of psychological transference fucked up. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, this is fucking twisted. I'm really enjoying that. <laughs> You're like, yeah, all right. Wait, no, that's not cool. Uh, then she runs off and she goes to actually kill herself with a pair of scissors. But her dad stops her. It'd be funny if the scissors melted on contact and she couldn't do it. Right? Like she can't even kill herself. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, Let's see here. She tells him that she will try again and that he can't be everywhere at once. So uh, the boy brings the lizard to his professor who will look into the matter. He says he'll look into it. Uh, The boy gets a note to meet with the father and that actually is our next clip. But then perhaps it's just as well that we talk by ourselves. When I realized how serious things were between the two of you, I, I wanted you to have an explanation. An explanation or a hopeless apology for what you've done to her? Do you think my knowledge is so little that I cannot undo what I have done? Do you think I would have brought you here to offer my daughter's hand in marriage if I did not think you could be married? If that is the truth. Beatrice wants you. Her happiness is my only concern. Sir, it is mine too. Good. And shall we drink on that? Are you sure Beatrice will be all right, sir? Yes. I don't know what your experiments were, but if it had to do with making her immune to poison... You need not concern yourself. The greater feat, Giovanni, would have been to make the human mind immune to the poison of evil rather than the poison of chemistry. To the only two men who will ever be in my daughter's life, Sir, an hour ago, I felt as if the world had been pulled out from under me. Now the world is back where it should be. Ooh. Ooh. Now he has to get the father's permission to be with the daughter, which is... And also the father's like, the only two men will ever be in my daughter's life. Holy shit. Yeah, that's also creepy. The way Vincent Price says that makes me think that there's all sorts of, like, therapy bills in the future for this little girl. I mean, there should be, but, uh, you know, therapy doesn't exist except for, you know, do cocaine about your problems. (laughs) Yeah, man, this is really dark and twisted and fucked. I wasn't enjoying this as much when 
I was watching it, but playing it back and thinking about it more and talking about it, I'm having yeah. a lot more of a blast at how sinister this is. I mean, it's fucking dark. <laughs> um, it's it's fucking, it's just wrong. <laughs> but so, it feels so right, Matt. It, <laughs> Uh, so then the boy starts to get all groggy after he takes a drink and passes out. He then awakes and the dad has injected him with the potion. Uh, the dad says that now that those two can be together now as they both have the, the shit inside their veins and can touch each other. So they'll never have any evil, they'll never have any sin, and they can be together forever. Yeah, he basically, he, being all patriarchal, is saying, you are the man who will be able to marry my daughter. Here's the dowry. Yeah, I mean, you can not, touch her. You can't, and now, yeah, now you can't touch anybody else either. Yeah, without killing them, which really isn't necessarily, well, I guess it burns them up so you can't literally touch them. Yeah. So then he tells him to go to her and marry her and hold her, but he freaks out and runs back to his place. He sees a spider and he touches it and he kills it, just like the butterfly. Uh, he then goes to his professor with the problem. And the professor states that while the problem is complex, there may be a cure. He, he even has the cure. But they have to do tests and it might take years. But Giovanni says that... Uh, that they can't wait that long and he needs it now <laughs> which so is always Giovanni a good decision for a vaccine yeah right so giovanni he takes the solution and leaves he finds beatrice and he embraces her and they kiss and she wants to know why and he goes your father didn't tell you so he tells her what her dad did he says they have the potion to maybe fix it but he has to try it first he takes it and it ends up killing him the uh vincent price comes out and he's shocked saying the fool there's nothing that that drinking that only meant it was poison because the potion that he gave took over the blood supply. There's no blood in their bodies anymore. It's just this potion. Well, says she says she's going to take it also, and she takes it before he can stop her, and she dies. At this point, the dad looks over, takes off his gloves, grabs the death plant, and then he dies, leading to Vincent Price, closing it out in our next clip. Where does evil begin, and where does it end? Can the eye of man really discern the fine line that separates sanity from... Man. If not, can there be a judge so wise that he can measure a man's reasons for the sins he commits? All right, so this one is a pretty straight up controlling patriarchal awful father who is insane because his wife left him and was cheating on him. So he yeah. took it all out on his daughter and perpetuated years and years of abuse. And rather than live under his control with the man that he deems worthy to be able to touch her and then also rendered unable to touch anyone else, rather than live under her father's control any longer, the antidote, regardless of what it did to them, was the better choice for them which is yes a real ec comic style of that driving that irony home <laughs> but the way that they got free was by getting an antidote to the poison that was keeping them alive like that whole you know <laughs> just driving the point yeah further death home. was better than life well living in that way in her case yes this guy is a fucking idiot and the whole romeo and juliet thing like come on i mean i know he was poisoned also against his will but it's it's a little odd that he went so far for a girl that he only had a few conversations with like there's no other girls in your town why are you working so hard with this one and why can't you just stay friends with her why do you have to make it a relationship you know he, they, ta he they, talks to her like they fall in love easy man they, they right? it's a little fast come on <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying they, they they fall in love easy back then. It's it's just how it happened. <sighs> no, um, no, no. It's it's because they it's a longer story that they rushed and they're trying to force like it. it they should have shown a, a sequence of days of them conversing in the garden and Prince and Price's yeah, character I, getting jealous. This was this was not my favorite story. Uh, the 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 stories. This is I'll I'll let it out. This is probably my least favorite. Okay, well, since you've kind of already spoiled it, I will say that this one is possibly my least favorite, but. But there's concepts I like. It's the execution I have an issue with. There you go. I, you know what? And I can be. I can agree with that too. Yeah. So we we can we can move on from this and let's go into the next one. So I'm guessing that is clip number nine. Yes, it's the House of the Seven Gables, and we open it up with you know more monologuing. The House of the Seven Gables began its existence in a year of terror. It was in 1691 that mass hysteria gripped New England and innocent people were executed as witches. Yes, it was a time of horror and blood and left a mark on the house that was not to be forgotten for more than 
150 years. Hardcore. Yeah, it, so, it feels a little bit like Dark Shadows, doesn't it? The way that they do this yeah. intro. Yeah, no, you're you're not wrong. Um, so we, uh, a man named Gerald, he comes home, uh, after being away for 17 years with his wife, Alice. He is met by his sister, Hannah, who is very unhappy with this return, letting him know he should not have come back. Even the stage carrier who would brought up their bags when was like, hey, our rooms are upstairs. He said he will not take another step into this room that they're in. He was like, that's just not happening. No. Yeah. It's, no it's like the Borgo pass whenever the carriage stops and refuses to take Jonathan Harker any further. It's that sort of yeah. thing where they're trying to set up something horrible and foul is afoot in this place to the point that he won't even walk into the foyer more. Yeah. Right. There's, there's horror afoot. <laughs> there's so, horror afoot and beyond the foyer. I shall not tread. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, uh, Hannah then states, uh, that, uh, the whole town pretty much know that a male member of the family is now back. Uh, they want to be shown the rooms, but, uh, Alice, the wife, says we need two separate rooms as Gerald is a light sleeper and will disturb him. Uh, Hannah then, as they go up, tells Alice that it was a mistake for him to come home. Alice says she has no clue why they're here, but she states she has been living with his many mistakes. So you can already tell there's, uh, there's not a lot of happiness here. Yeah, this I, I I feel like maybe this one's more the least favorite for me than the last one. Oh yeah, yeah, but we'll we'll get to it. Keep going. All right, so uh, she gets uh, cold heading to one of the rooms, and then in her room, she uh, tells Hannah that she can't wait to check out the garden. But neither of them know how she would even know about that garden. She wasn't told by Gerald, and she's never been there before. So everyone thinks it's really strange that uh, she she would know that. Uh, Hannah leaves the room, and the door opens on its own. And Hannah enters this room and she finds a locket with a painting in it that looks just like her. Hannah then finds Gerald, and that is our next clip. Afraid of a blood stained chair, Gerald? Or does it hold too much knowledge of our illustrious male ancestors who died in it? Don't look forward to my early death, Hannah. I have no intention of honoring the chair with my corpse. He didn't either. But you're a fool. Has any man in our family ever died otherwise? Then I shall be the first not to. I will not be frightened away, Hannah. When I get what I want from this house, then I'll leave and not before. Do you think you can outwit a ghost? Are you so immune to death that you can defy a curse that has ruined the pension family? I'll stay alive as long as is necessary. You don't have a choice. The man buried under this house won't wait. Go back to your books of demons and witchcraft. They're your only companions. Why not? It wasn't the dead who gambled away the family fortunes. And now that you've bankrupted us, you think you can come back here and take what is rightfully mine? Yours. You assume a great deal, my dear sister. You'll never find that vault, Gerald. I've searched this house from top to bottom, just as every pension has searched it for 150 years. The ghost won't let you find it. It isn't where you look for it, Hannah. It's how... Now, let us see if a dead man can stop me. So, uh, it's kind of not a great, healthy relationship between brother and sister. I mean, it depends upon, you know, your family dynamic, but I can see where you would have a problem with everything they had to say. I mean, it, it's death threats and hoping one another dies. That doesn't sound like all that great. Is that not healthy? That's not healthy. Oh. You all right over there? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Everything okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll be fine. Just let's move on. You, you want to play some ball later? <laughs> No, it's it's nowhere near like that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, that night, Gerald is waiting for a visitor, and his sister uh, razzes him a bit about the vault trying to find it. Then the wife comes out, and she says Jonathan Moore is coming. Both look shocked, and Gerald more so because that's who's coming to visit him, but he never told her, and she doesn't know how she knows that. Then we see Jonathan showing up, and... Um, and then, well, there's no idea how the wife knows. Hannah thinks the house wants her to know that Jonathan's showing up. Uh, Allison starts playing some music, and John, uh, this John guy gets all like, what the hell? Uh, you know, almost creeped out. They make it some eye contact, and it's like really powerful. And he wants to know the music she played, but she has no idea how she knew to play it. She's never played it before. She's never studied it. She's never seen that kind of music. Um... So then John and Gerald talks of business, and that's our next clip. Have a seat, Mr. Moore. I am uh, 
Not disregarding the long unpleasantness that has existed between our families, sir. But I always say that uh, good whiskey is better than oil to toss on troubled waters. And so, your health, sir? It's not like a pension to ask them all to pass the time of day. No, of course not. Not unless they both had something to gain. Our ancestors would say the pensions did all the gaining. We live in an enlightened age, Mr. Maul. A family feud that began in 1690 can scarcely affect us. What is it you want, Pension? I would like to make a trade with you, sir. For generations, your family has been in possession of certain information. Are you referring to the vault that's hidden in this house? Precisely, sir. Your ancestor was the architect of this place. He would have known where the vault is. Didn't your sister tell you that uh, she tried to find out what I know ten years ago? I presumed she had. But I have a different proposition to make, sir. The House of the Seven Gables, for your information. What are you offering me, Pynchon? A decayed tomb built on land that was stolen from my ancestors? The courts settled that issue 150 years ago, sir. Courts that the Pynchons controlled. If I did know where the vault is, you couldn't get it out of me at any price. My family has suffered enough from the curse that was put on them by a mall. Have you tried explaining that to the man buried in your cellar? I say that the curse is finished. The past stays in the past. Man, he's just fucking making enemies left and right. Yeah, right? Jesus Christ. But I guess, you know, for him, it kind of makes sense, because he's like, hey, I'm, I'm done with this fucking curse, man. Why, why has it got to be like this constantly? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, so, um, then uh, we see uh, blood coming from a painting's mouth, a painting of one of Alex's uh, ancestors. And John talks about it, saying, you know, yeah, the, the curse said you would always have, you know, you would always drink blood. So then uh, John walks out and he and Alice talks. Um, he said the reason he was, you know, so blinded by that music is because it was from his childhood. And he said he had had this feeling that he knew she was going to be at this house and he needed to come here or else he never would have come. Uh, he had uh, visions also of one another before meeting. She had visions of him. He had visions of her. He states that the man Matthew Moore cursed the house and is buried underneath it. She tells him about the door opening and shows him the locket with the painting that looks like her. Uh, she says she's going to leave this place forever tomorrow, but she gives him the locket. Uh, as Alice goes back in the house, she sees the blending painting. It runs away and Gerald goes after her, but she locks herself in her room. Uh, she then states that she's leaving and he can't stop her. Uh, as, uh, they are yelling, he hears, like, a noise in the house and he decides to leave and go to his room. Uh, that night, Alice hears something calling a name. Uh, it sounds like Hannah, I assume. Uh, she walks and the doors start opening for her and she goes out. She sees a vision of a man that is this Matthew Moore. She goes up to him and she holds him, saying Matthew and saying that he's been... She's been waiting all these years for him. When all of a sudden she looks up and the Matthew Moore vision goes away, she's actually holding on to John Moore. John tells her that Matt was a blacksmith, and that's why he was kind of dressed in the apron and everything, on this very property, his blacksmith area. Um, and then he also states that uh, if she knows a Deborah Holbrook, and she goes, that is was her grandmother, and he goes, that's whose painting is in this locket. He said he discovered uh, that uh, Deborah and Matt were actually supposed to get married, but hang uh, Matt was hanged as a witch so that uh, Gerald's family could go ahead and have and take this land. Um, but then Matt's brother, he designed the house, so it was almost like a last trick thing to do to the family. Uh, they believe they are to love one another, and they they actually kiss. Uh, all during this, Gerald is watching, and he wants to kill them both, but his sister stops him, saying that those two are the key to finding the vault. Alice stops John and says that 
she is technically still married to Gerald, and they will never meet again. So she's putting an end to the malarkey. We see another door opens, compelling Alice to walk in. And he mer- here's more calls. I'm sorry, not Hannah. It's always called for Nora. Um, She sees uh written, she's in the cellar. She sees written in the dust that she must not leave. That's what's written there. And then Gerald and his sister follow her, but the writing is now gone. The two start questioning her and threatening her when they start hearing a piano playing. They go up because they're like, no one's here, and they see the piano is playing by itself. Gerald starts going a little crazy and, like, talking shit to the ghosts, and then the house starts rocking like an earthquake. Um, we see walls and ceilings split, and when they do, blood starts pouring out. Alice kind of freaks out, and, uh, she fucking has to, uh, she passes out. So, that's, that's no good for her. Uh... <laughs> I mean, yeah, you could say that. I, I suppose not. It wouldn't be good for anybody to see ceilings and, and walls bleeding. Um, I would be okay with it. Yeah, you, but you're fucked up. Yeah, I mean, but, I, I don't know how many more times I have to say this to you. I mean, I, I kind of have seen that, and then I realized somebody dosed me. Oh, really? <laughs> that uh, shit actually happened? But my lawyer is advising me to say that that was a joke. How many lawyers is that, Court? <laughs> Currently one. Let's move on. <laughs> So anyway, uh, they, um, the, the sister actually starts taking care of Alice. And as they care for her, Gerald pours her a glass of water. But once he does, it turns into blood. So he's not like, got like the, like the, the wasteful Jesus, you know, where Jesus gets to, uh, uh, you know, turn water into wine. He just gets to turn water into blood. No, so he's vampire like, Jesus. He's not being wasteful. He's a vampire Jesus. Oh, I, I, for you're right. For vampires, he's he's got it. Raid. You know, they they would very much like him. Yeah, you're you're right about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, so he goes back down the stairs. He starts digging up the area in which Alice was standing, and he finds there's a crypt, and he opens up the top, and there's a skeleton, but only has one arm. But underneath the skeleton is a map to the vault that's uh, behind, he believes, behind the portrait above the fireplace. Uh, the sister and him plan on splitting because he's hoping the deed to the land in Maid is in there, which will be worth millions, he says. And the sister says they'll split it and they'll have more than enough for one another. Uh, at that point, he says, yes, let's have a celebration. He goes, however, I want to celebrate alone. And he kills his sister with a pickaxe to the head. So no honor amongst thieves, I guess. Yeah. That one's a, that one's a little rough. <laughs> Felt bad for the sister there, I, but I, not really. I, I really did not at all, and I think that this also houses some of the weakest effects of all of the yeah. films. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the effects on this weren't weren't great. Yeah. That is uh that's true. And a lot of the uh, story is essentially like a lifetime movie of family betrayal and weirdness. Yeah. It, yeah. It's really kind of subpar. <laughs> so the more I thought about this one the more I'm like, yeah, this is my least favorite. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, see, I, this is the one I just thought was kind of okay. Ah. Okay. Um, well, let's we'll keep going then. Yeah, okay. So then Alice sees that he has killed his sister and she screams Well, he takes her down and he starts slapping her around because, you know, talking to her about the, you know, what he saw with John and then tells her that he's, you know, uh, he throws her into the crypt and he covers her up with the met, uh, the concrete slab. The only problem is she gets her hand out there, but it crushes it and blood comes out. Well, then we go back to John, who has the locket, and the locket starts bleeding, so he knows he hops into action. Uh, then we see uh, Gerald, uh, he finds the vault, and as he gets it open, we see a skeleton hand comes out, starts choking him in the chair that all the rest of his family members had died in. When this happens, the heart starts to shake and fall apart. John gets in there, finds uh, he, he finds her, uh, or finds Alice, and he's able to save her and get her out. And in the end, as the house collapse, we end with Vincent Price's narration in our final clip. Thus did the House of the Seven Gables come to its end, destroyed by the decay of greed and hate that had corroded its very foundations. It was a time now for Matthew Moore to find peace. And roll credits. Yeah, this is the weakest story. I can see where you would feel it's just kind of okay, but 
Yeah. The more I started thinking about the one with the plant and all the fucked up shit and how the plant is all weird and Lovecraft looking where it's just not right. And it's all these bright like violets and weird hues of like magenta and shit and how the slightest touch this poison is so bad. It's caustic and burns like an acid. Like I really start thinking about that one in the way the effects are. And I'm really liking that one much, much more. So, huh. yeah. You know, I never thought of it like that. And I, I, I could see what you say. I guess to me... Maybe it's not that I really disliked one. I, I probably should. That was maybe a little bit more, um, uh, maybe more hyperbole than it needed to be. Um, I guess it was like I really liked one story and just kind of liked the other two. So they could flip flop to me at least. Yeah. Um, now, one is my favorite, but not because I feel it is the best story. It's because it's the best presentation. All the effects are amazing. They really threw everything at you to get your attention and really lull you in. And I think the story itself just is maybe a little weaker and it could have been fleshed out better and there's more stuff they could do with it. And I, I, I don't know, like, I just want more horror to come out of all of this, like, because it's all these horrible people, all these horrible situations, and they could have just made it even more dark and twisted and nasty. And like, they just they didn't. <laughs> yeah, I get I kind of get what you're saying. Like, I thought maybe you the first story being my favorite was and i even like the story but i agree there could have been more and i i think I, I i didn't time it i think it was the shortest one out of the three it is all right see i think you could have taken away either part some of part two time some of part three time some of it maybe both of those times at the time i would have loved it they would have really drawn it out they even maybe like um they conspire together the the you know and they kill carl and then he's they're finally going to have the wedding they want and yeah when he like goes to kiss the bride she's then nothing but ash and bone and he's old and like yeah it could have gone so much more wicked in that kind of sense so i could have done that too but i still think it was a better story uh than the other two and it had the better effects and i liked the three actors and how they played off of one another yeah i can agree with although you i did i did like alex having that he wasn't just like uh this carl is a is a rube, and I don't even like him. He loved Carl as well as a friend. He just happened to also love the woman that Carl loved, and he didn't want to kill Carl. Like, at the very end, when he's weeping, that they took Carl from him. Yeah, but he has no he, problems murdering a woman that Carl would love for the rest of his life. Yeah, no, again, I'm not saying Alex is a good person. He's not. But I liked how complex they made him, because he wasn't just, I hate Carl. I just hang out with him to mock him and shit. He loved Carl as a friend, but unfortunately he has some really deep, dark demons that he didn't deal with well. And, you know, one being a murderer. So, uh, in a casual murderer at that. Um, so yeah, I, I just, there's, there's so much more they could have done with that fourth story. You're right. But it's still my favorite story. I think it had the best basis out of all three stories. Yeah. And I don't disagree with anything you had to say, but the stuff that was going on with the sort of almost reverse Oedipal thing where the father's like obsessively controlling of the daughter and giving her no agency over her own body or any like just keeping her prison because prisoner because of what happened to him and these weird draconian rules of chastity that he feels everyone should have to follow you know it's just so the more i thought about it the more twisted and dark it was i was leaning more towards the first one being my favorite anyway but the the second one as we talked about it creeped me out even more and i started liking it even more to the point where that one became my favorite of the two and i thought i didn't like it you know yeah, you know what I could see what you're saying uh, about that second one. That does, the more we just talked about it, like the more I went through my notes and kind of how we uh, expanded upon it, that does have an interesting tale it could tell with uh, a man so obsessed about his wife leaving him for another man that he takes it out on his daughter in the guise of trying to help his daughter stay away from quote unquote sin. Uh, it's, it's a great kind of story you could tell. I, I think they fumbled it a bit. I would still like the first story better, but I think I'm kind of flip-flopping here where at first I thought the second was the one I disliked the least because I, I disliked the whole plant thing. I thought that was like so forced, but I think the story's better than a, a, an old family curse because it's almost that other one's based in science where this one you have to believe in witchcraft. So if they put a curse on the family, it means they were guilty of witchcraft. You know, the, the one thing that he was found guilty of. Guilty of. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. It, the, the whole, 
the whole entirety of House of Seven Gables is my least favorite. Um, I I just am not a fan of it in any way, really, shape, or form. It really kind of bored me, and I, I didn't like it. Uh, now the way that I saw this film, there's a story that I have to tell there. So I, okay. I, I'm kind of done talking about the three stories anyway on, on how they went. Right, kind of yeah, dug yeah, into so am I. I think yeah. we, I think we got everything yeah. out there. And I, but I, just to end it with, I, I enjoyed this story. Uh, this this movie immensely of made up of three mini movies. I really liked it. Uh, and you know, doesn't doesn't hurt to have Vincent Price lead up all three movies. You know, I would have enjoyed it significantly less if it wasn't carried very heavily on the back of Vincent Price. And that's another thing I'll get to as well. But I want to tell this story. All right. All right. Go ahead. The first time that I saw this movie was because I had my literature teacher or my literary teacher for that English course gave zero fucks anymore about anything and was bilking the school system for cash. She had tenure and she was literally just going longer to push her her salary cap for retirement to be a little bit higher. That's all. And she gave zero fucks. We never read a fucking thing in the entirety of her literature class. Instead, we watched movie adaptations of the novels we were supposed to read in her class while she fucking slept. Ah, fucking wicked. This was her final year, apparently, because she retired right after this or they caught wind of it. But this this was also my senior year. She was my English teacher, like my senior year, I think. Some brown nosing kid probably ratted her out. But here's the thing. Most of us that had her classes all agreed that we were going to let her get away with this. I would, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so the very first one when she decided that the point in teaching us that she went from fuck it, none of you can read anyway, which was kind of true in the school that I went to, except for me, (laughs) You know, if I'm the one of the yeah. smartest people in your fucking school, your school has a problem is all I'm saying. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so she basically gives up and plays this movie. We were supposed to discuss the novel House of the Seven Gables, but rather than play the movie from 1940 that also starred Vincent Price that was about House of the Seven Gables, she chose this one because it was shorter and easier for her to find. And she played just the segment of House of Seven Gables. And then when we were being taught about the actual twice told tales she went back and played the first segment because it actually is one of the twice told tales adapted and then she played another vincent price movie i think it was tales of terror that had some other stuff in it as well which solidified my love of this teacher and we thought she was awesome (laughs) she sounds awesome yeah well in retrospect she wasn't doing her job at all and i'm dumber for it when it comes to literature um it could probably be traced directly to her but i'm not going to dime her name out but at the same time my love of classic weird cinema was definitely shaped by the stuff that she found and she was an awesome freaking teacher but that's that's how i saw this for the first time i was, was, I was gonna say was in like a they, literature class in high school don't blame her for no, <laughs> for your failings no i'm just kidding yeah Although, i i mean that's exactly who you're supposed to blame because she is you know yeah your teacher yeah i was supposed to be educated and instead i was played vincent price movies i think i'm better for it though matt I think so too. I, you know what? If I were you, I'd I'd be thankful for the uh for for the care you were given. If nothing else, it gave me this story for my fake radio show on the internet that no one even cares about. Yeah, that everyone hates us for. <laughs> there you got it from Matt, folks. Everybody hates him. <laughs> well, I actually do believe that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, make everybody love you again and give them some psyop news. We're going to play the Geek Radio Daily promo. We're going to have some more music that fits in with the eerie, spooky feel of Twice Told Tales. And when we come back, we'll do some psyop news. Are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery? Is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world? To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather.
Sometimes you can observe copyright law as one should and still get something that sounds like you stole it right out of the movie. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, you did really good on this one. This is really well done because, yeah, this sounds like it could be exactly what should be in this movie. <laughs> well, my bitchiness was appeased by the benevolence of our good leader, Bo. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he helped me find stuff that would work and that had a reasonable search engine to be able to find the sort of thing that I'm looking for. And the website is great. And it's only for our Legion podcast brethren. So uh, you need nice. something you can get to Bo on that. And he's been very good at helping me get the stuff. So I, I have to thank him for that. All right. Way to go, Bo. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I will thank you to give me some psyop news. comes from uh damien that is our boy the witch ah it's the witch it comes from the witch uh and of course it's aussie news but why wouldn't it be uh, <laughs> it would only make sense yeah malawi man dies after extreme orgasm with sex worker shooting a fucking hot load all over this dog shoot some it, fucking ropes it sounded like there was too many ropes shooting a fucking uh, hot uh, load all over this dog shoot some fucking ropes a man has died after from an extreme orgasm after passing out while he romped with a sex worker. The 35-year-old, named in the police report as Charles Mawa, lost consciousness after having sex with a woman in the trading district of uh, Falumbi, Malawi. Uh, he I died have a shortly. Ragey direction. He he must have. Uh, he died shortly after doing the deed, and the postmortem has officially determined the cause of death as an excessive orgasm. The sex worker decided to report the death to the police after speaking with her colleagues. Cops Shooting and the a fucking medical... hot load all over this dog. <laughs> Shoot the some fucking the, ropes. The, the, uh, the cops, the medical examiner uh, from the health center, viewed the body and confirmed the cause of death on August 18th last year. Countdown to the, Bukaki. A postmortem report listed the cause of death as being due to excessive orgasm, which caused blood vessels in the brain to rupture. Blood jizz. W- holy shit. Yeah. Blood jizz. <laughs> I mean, I guess. I, 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 I mean. Blood jizz. W- what was she doing? Your cum will probably <laughs> taste better. If you die while excreting it, probably. Well, yeah, but I mean, I just say what was the sex worker was, you know what she was doing? Doing her job in the most effective way fucking possible. It's going to cost you some serious cock and your life. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, Everyone will be coming they, on my face. They also added that no charges would be made related to his death. Um, uh, yeah, and the woman will not be held liable for the death at all. Uh, senior chief uh, reports that uh, the man's body was taken back to his home village. And uh, according to local newspaper, Nisa Times, the man died of too much sexual excitement and sweetness. Why are you coming to public swimming pools? Why are you coming to public swimming pools? <laughs> I'm going to read that again. That made me laugh. Blood he died of t- too much sexual excitement and sweetness. Blood jizz. Blood jizz. Blood jizz. Blood jizz. Blood jizz. <laughs> you have to give me a minute. Shooting a fucking hot load. Shoot all over some this fucking dog. ropes. Shooting a fucking hot load. Shoot all some over this fucking dog. ropes. Blood jizz. Blood jizz. <laughs> blood jizz. Blood jizz. A man's dead. I shouldn't be laughing this much. <laughs> <laughs> but what a way to go, right? I, it's so much sweetness. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I want to go. I want to go from an excessive orgasm and so much sweetness. Like, I want that to be on my death certificate. Dude, you could brag in the afterlife forever oh, yeah. on that. Dude, it felt so good. Dead. I knew it was going to be the best orgasm I had in my life. Woo! 
<laughs> that lady, you think the sex worker, like, under, like, if she gets a yearly review, they're gonna be like, well, I don't, I don't really know where you go from here. You did it so well, you killed the guy. <laughs> we'll literally make you <laughs> orgasm so much, you die. <laughs> you die. You're in. That's oh. that's a review for a sex worker that you definitely want. <laughs> yeah, five stars. <laughs> Posthumously. Would go again if I could live. Yeah. Posthumously, five stars. Five stars. Yeah. <laughs> Would definitely do it again. It's a tragic. Uh, it's a tragic, but a noble death, and seriously, one that yeah. I would feel okay about having. Yeah, I <laughs> too much sexual excitement and sweetness. <laughs> all right, we're gonna pull the chain on that. We need to. Right, we need it, to cut you off because you're having way too much goddamn fun with that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We're going to play the so, Ending uh, Legion promo here. We're going to have a little right, bit of music. Right, yeah, get, get me out of this. you got to <laughs> save me for myself right now. We're going to have a little bit of music that fits in with the theme <laughs> for Twice Told Tale. And when we come back, we will close out this fucking show. <laughs> If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which Versus the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. much more somber and serious tone that we should be handling that poor gentleman's death with. Yeah, 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 of course. Unlike Matt, who could be heard laughing the entirety of the Legion, (laughs) ending Legion show promo in the background by me. Yeah, 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 well, fuck it. (laughs) My bad. If you'd like to find other instances of Matt being an insensitive prick to someone else's death, you can check it out on legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. There are 285 other instances of Matt being a heartless prick in the face of someone else's death. Whoa, 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 whoa. Fucking me. <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> you can also join the Facebook group Cinema PsyOps, where we can have a very heated discussion on which one of us takes more glee over the death of a helpless and innocent human being. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. I'm available there <laughs> as you. Court PsyOps, and he is available there sometimes when he kind of feels like it and is ignoring his son as Matt PsyOp. I mean, did you have to dime me out like that? He's going to probably hear this someday. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can email feedback to Matt posthumously at psyopmatt at gmail.com when you find that out and want to yell at him and this is your only recourse. The good news is, either way, he'll never read it. Never. Never. I, I don't care. <laughs> you can email feedback to court, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. Let him know that he's being really fucking petty in the way that he's treating Matt lately, and it's a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. What's up with that? Just, you know, fucking, I don't know. <laughs> You can tweet a couple of tweets to a couple of twats on the hate-filled shit fest that has been reformed to a porn bot paradise known as Twitter. Yeah, just stay away from fucking Republican council people and congress people and you'll be fine. But they're getting banned more and more every day, so we're fine with that. I am at court underscore psyop there and he is at psyop Matt, although he's also hardly ever there unless it's to follow said porn bots. Yeah, I mean, come on. What else am I going to do with my life? You can follow me on Instagram. I'm cinema underscore psyops there. That is where all of the sweet and tasty oh-so-repurposed memes for the people are available. Mmm, the people's republic of shared memes. Well, folks, while you're out there orgasming to the point of your own death, make sure that you previously kicked the fuck out of the week and made it your bitch. Fuck you, Matt. Fuck you, Matt. Fuck Matt. Fuck Matt. Fuck him. Fuck him. Fuck him. Fuck him. I mean, yeah, sounds a lot of what my inner lot of monologue sounds like usually, so we're good. Question. Yeah. Would you say on a scale of minimally to monumentally, how big did you fuck up tonight to be 45 minutes late? Monumentally. <laughs> Is this a story for the air? I mean, I don't know how interesting. It, it really it's kind of like just the dumbest thing you could do because uh, there are 12 total clips. And when I got done with 10 of them and I only had two left, I uh, I deleted uh, the uh, I accidentally 10 of the clips that were done and they were just gone. <laughs> <laughs> just not even paying attention because I always typically when I get done with one clip, I will delete it, the unedited clip. And I hadn't been doing that. I was like, oh, I should get rid of those before I, you know, fucking lose it and fucking OCD kicks in. And then I realized I wasn't really looking and I deleted the 10 edited clips instead of the 10 unedited clips. Are you recording on your side? I am now. One, two, three. Your waveform looks so, yeah. good. What? Your waveform looks good. You're on the snowboard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Everything looks good. <laughs> That's my monumental fuck up for the day. Yeah. You 10, I mean, full, 12 total clips. 10 of them are done. And you delete the 10 that you just finished editing by accident. That is, that's monumental. That's borderline epic. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's borderline. That is just a travesty of justice. <laughs> Well, considering how miserable and unhappy you are, that just put me in a better mood, so I can't wait to do the show. Awesome. That's great. I'm <laughs> glad everyone's having a good time. <laughs> Fuckers. All right, here we go. He thinks it came from a virgin spring, an untouched spring, and that's maybe why it has these healing properties. Oh, they... I thought he was referring to the Bergman film, which you wouldn't want to drink that water. No, no, no. I don't believe that's what he was referring to. I think he was uh, referring to the fact that, uh, you know, he's, you know, being uh, that uh, it's a spring not touched by man. So it has all these healing properties. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm making a joke out there. Someone that has seen the Virgin Spring <laughs> just cringed <laughs> at the joke that I made. Yeah. So they're like, oh, court. Why? <laughs> well, no, they're probably more like, oh, God, court. Why? <laughs> why have you done this, court? Why? I'm me. I, I can't yeah, help well, it. 
Yeah, well, true. I'm the scorpion uh, on the frog's back, baby. I can't help it. <laughs> That's the cross dissolves in time lapse. What's that? Just a sec. Right. Chewing ice. Nice. Yeah, once it gets um, once it gets the full color back into it, and he doesn't look all haggard about the eyes and face, I was able to really appreciate the beard, which makes me old age makeupist. Yeah, right. Jeez, what's wrong with you? I'm prejudiced against actors in old age makeup, Matt. That's just fucked up. It's, it's fucked a, up, Court. You a, thought we'd be beyond that. It's a small percentage of the population, Matt. It's, oh, that, that should make a difference, Court. <laughs> it doesn't make it better, Court. God, Court, you're terrible kind of causes Carl to stab himself in the stomach, it seems. Killing him. Yeah, he used some uh, Aikido shit that he learned from Steven Seagal. Yeah. And turned yeah, the knife yeah, around on him. He did a judo chop. And, uh, <laughs> no, he didn't do some kind of Austin Powers judo chop. No, he chop. did a judo chop. I saw it. Trust me, I know martial arts, okay? You don't. I do. <laughs> I'm well versed. Uh, <laughs> wow, thanks for mansplaining, dude. You're welcome. Finally. <laughs> Someone thanked me for it. Jeez, usually my wife just threatens me with divorce for it. Yeah, this is fucking twisted. I'm really enjoying that. <laughs> You're like, yeah, all right. Wait, no, that's not cool. <laughs> Why do I like this? Why does this make me happy? <laughs> I'm fucked up. Uh, shit, man, I lost my place. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess it burns them up so you can't literally touch them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just, uh, you're you're out of there. And I mean, if you find a good introvert, they'd be like, thank God. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm raising my hand over here, but you can't see yeah. it. <laughs> and, uh, no, so I just then, like, Matt, I just like the idea that anybody I touch, I could kill. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, or like a psychopath might be like, oh my God. Either way, I'm raising my hand. Best day ever. Yeah, I'm raising my hand either way, Matt. <laughs> This is the best day ever! <laughs> I can kill people with my pinky! So she's putting an end to the malarkey. <laughs> All right, Mr. Biden. Oh, will you shut up, man? <laughs> he is the uh, most famous user of the word malarkey. Yeah, that is. That is very true. Uh, it, it's a great word to use. I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whatever. <laughs> I like malarkey. I don't care um, much. All right, motherfucker. Jesus. there orgasming to the point of your own death make sure that you previously kicked the fuck out of the week and made it your bitch well i guess we're out all right <laughs> you're not even gonna have... you're not even gonna respond on that you're just gonna yeah whatever court let's just be yeah. done <laughs> hey you're <laughs> the one that made us late tonight pal not me uh, uh, no, uh, you know what we we were pretty efficient with the movies though yeah that's because i really have to take a leak so let's get this done <laughs> <laughs> all right man i've stopped recording